yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, kind of the process I'm going through to try to adopt a ridge till system for vegetables on my farm. So I'm going to start just by talking a little bit about my operation, Middleway Farm, and then I'll go into kind of the, the thinking process that's led me to ridge till. Then I'll go through a few different ridge till systems that I've drawn from to develop my own system and then what I'm doing um, as of now. Um, so I run Middleway Farm. Uh, I started in 2013. I've been running the farm full-time since 2016, so this was the end of my third season uh, as a full-time farmer. I, I lease uh, about 10 acres of land just north of Grinnell. I live in town, so I'm a commuter farmer, but it's about only about two and a half miles. Uh, so I have about two of those 10 acres in vegetable production. The rest is in a buffer uh, zone um, from the conventional crops that are on the rest of the farm. Um, and uh, my primary markets are uh, CSA and Farmer's Market in Grinnell, the Iowa Food Co-op in Des Moines, and then a few restaurants and groceries. Um, this is a view from 2015 that just gives you an idea of kind of what my fields were looked like at that point and uh, kind of the orientation of the land and, and so on. I do have that greenhouse, heated greenhouse in the background, and I just added a high tunnel uh, this past season. Um, this is from 2014. You can see kind of the system that I started with farming, um, a raised bed system basically using a BCS um, rototiller and a BCS rotary plow to shape the beds. So I did a lot of this raised bed shaping with the rotary plow to start. Um, and that was how I did most of my beds up through about 2016. And then since then I've, I've uh, um, been working more on incorporating the tractor into my operation. Um, and that's kind of led me towards ridge till. Um, but just to show you that I do produce vegetables, this is an example of a spring share from last year. Um, I usually start my, my CSA shares in May and they run through November, although I've decided to shorten the season a little bit um, this coming year. So I'm just focusing on, on the summer, summer season from June through October with the option of adding a, a, a fall CSA. Um, this is kind of a height of the summer share um, from uh, late August, early September. Uh, and then this is a CSA from, from the fall uh, around Thanksgiving time. Um, and then I also do farmer's market in Grinnell. Um, and so I bring quite a bit of produce, produce down there every week from uh, May through October. Um, so uh, as a farmer, I've, I started out with about a half acre or actually more like a third of an acre and I've, I've scaled up to two acres and my weeding has really not necessarily scaled up with it in terms of tools. I've, I basically continue to use wheel hose and hand hose and hand weeding as my primary, primary weed control. And so this is some, um, some carrots uh, from this past year that actually turned out to be a great crop of carrots, which you'll see later. Um, and uh, if things go well uh, in my system, then I, I get weeds controlled with the wheel hoe in a timely fashion and, um, and I get a good crop. Um, the problem I found is that it's pretty easy to get overwhelmed, particularly in May and June, when planting, harvesting, and weeding are all overlapping. And so I found myself over the years doing quite a bit of this, which is what I call rescue weeding. And it's often onions, but often other crops too. So this is from uh, June of this year. This is actually on my birthday. I mean, that's my mom in the lower right um, who is uh, helping weed. Um, but this is not a, not a good situation. I, I, most farmers will tell you if 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 this is what's happening, then you are you've already lost the battle. Um, you can salvage some crops this way, but this is certainly time inefficient, uh, labor inefficient, and it's compromising the the yield and quality of the crops. Uh, this is from uh, July of 2017, uh, chopping down sapling sized lambs quarters. It seems like it only took about four to six weeks for for these lambs quarter to go from emerge to over my head. And I'm sure some of you have had that experience as well with some of these really aggressive annual weeds. Um, and you can see in this photo that I, I've got some landscape fabric and also silage tarp, which were some techniques that I really um, incorporated over the last three years to, to try to deal with some of my weed problems. The landscape fabric being a method for controlling weeds on edges and also um, on beds themselves. And then the silage tarp being used to um, uh, basically kill weeds or, or keep weeds from sprouting in areas that weren't planted. Um, and I, I had some limited success with these techniques, but I found some major drawbacks that have caused me to, to reconsider using them. Um, th this was from 2017. So you can see these uh, 
uh, landscape fabric covered beds where I've burned holes in them to put transplants through. And I think this can be a pretty good system. I also have hay covering the pathways. Um, the, the problem I found is that um, with landscape fabric, you still have to do some hand weeding. And this is a, a total disaster from uh, the same year, 2017. This is my onion crop. And you can see that the weeds came on really strongly and I have no recourse here but to hand weed, but now I'm forced to hand weed through these small holes in the landscape fabric. And so I realized over the course of uh, that season that what I didn't like about the landscape fabric was uh, it, it forced you to do hand weeding. And if you got into a situation like, situation like this, you had no other recourse except to hand weed. There was no way I could mechanically control these weeds. Um, another issue I found with the landscape fabric was if you left it in place long enough, you would have soil start to pile on top of it and you just have weeds grow right on top of that. So this is crabgrass that's uh, uh, completely growing on top of the landscape fabric. And so I've ripped out all of that edge landscape fabric that I was using to try to control weeds from encroaching into my vegetable plots. So uh, last year, as I was sort of turning away from landscape fabric um, and reconsidering my, my weed control methods, I got some inspiration, uh, some inspiration from mounding potatoes. So this is a, uh, my potato plot from last year. Um, and this is just after I mounded up and I mounded up fairly aggressively and while the potatoes are fairly young and that was due to a variety of factors, including rain. But typically when um, you see people mound up potatoes, they'll allow them to grow a little bit taller before they mound them so that the, the stalks themselves aren't getting pressed down by the, by the soil being moved um, while you're mounding. Um, but what I realized while doing this uh, with this potato crop was that this was probably my cleanest field um, for the entire season and I spent the least amount of time weeding it than any other field because I did almost all of my weed control mechanically with the tractor using hilling discs and some sweeps. And so I started to think would it be possible for me to use this system for more than just potatoes? Um, and the graphic on the bottom just shows you um, the process of mounting up potatoes. The idea is that you plant the potato uh, somewhat shallowly or, or with a little bit of uh, soil over the top, but as it emerges and grows, you can actually mound the soil up around the base, which will cause the stem to, to produce more roots and therefore more tubers. It also has the benefit of when you throw that soil from the, from the pathways into the row, you're killing the weeds in the pathways, you're also smothering the weeds in the row. And so you're accomplishing both between row and in row weed control. And now this wasn't perfect weed control by any means, but it was actually fairly easy to go through by hand and, and get the weeds that we missed. So this was an example where I thought hand weeding actually made sense because I'd controlled 90% of the weeds. So I was doing a little bit of research about what crops um, work for mounding up besides potatoes, and I found there were some. And I started to, oh, I just, that wasn't the slide I was anticipating, but um, I'll talk a little bit more about Ridge Till after this. Um, but anyway, so I was starting to think about how I could uh, create a system based around um, using the tractor and potentially mounting up crops for better weed control. And uh, this fall, I experienced the worst flooding that I ever have in the seven years that I've been farming. Uh, this was Labor Day weekend um, uh, this past year, and this was my worst field. Not all of my fields look like this, but um, these are my beautiful fall greens, which were, and also uh, radishes and turnips that were drowned in several inches of water for, for several days. And the reason this happened was because on August 20th, we, it started to rain and um, the soil was fairly saturated and we'd had one or two inches over the past 10 days. And then over the course of two nights, we got almost four inches of rain and then uh, over three inches of rain. So a total of almost eight inches of rain in two nights on top of saturated soil. Um, and so that immediately led to that, that flooding that you saw and then it actually didn't really stopped raining completely for about another week after that. Um, and then just as things had started to dry out from that, uh, Columbus Day weekend, we had nearly the same amount of rain. And I had uh, similar amounts of water standing in my field, including on the right, you can see that's the same field that you saw in the previous picture uh, with standing water in it. Um, so that was, a, that was a very jarring to me. It was a huge wake up call because um, I noticed the ways that water wasn't infiltrating in my fields and uh, there's nothing I can do about uh, this amount of rain falling. Um, I went back and looked at the the numbers and uh, it was almost 20 inches of rain in 50 days um, and there was really less than one day where I could actually go out and do field work and, and even then it was it was fairly dicey. The soil was was too wet in a typical year for me to do anything but I decided I had to do it and I planted a lot of cover crops. 
Uh, that was in late September. But we got four to five times our average rainfall during that period. So there's nothing I can do about getting that amount of rain, but I did notice that um, the water was not infiltrating uh, as quickly as I thought it should be. Um, uh, and this is uh, actually uh, some of those carrots that I initially showed that, it, that were freshly weeded. This is, this is them when they were harvested in September, and it was a beautiful carrot crop. They're Bolero carrots, which is a store variety, storage variety. They were very large and beautiful, incredibly muddy. We pulled out as many as we could um, uh, just right after the rain. Um, and then this is what they look like when they were muddy. This is what it looked like when they'd been sprayed off a little bit. I actually clogged this drain that's in this photo. Um, completely plugged it full of mud because of I, everything that I was washing from late August through uh, through October was was completely covered in mud. But anyway, what I noticed when I was harvesting these carrots in particular was that uh, the carrots that went down six or seven inches, they would be completely covered in mud um, uh, all the way down to about the tip. And then at the tip, they would be sticking into the hard pan. And in that hard pan, they would actually be a little bit dry. So the tip of the carrot would be dry. So the carrot itself was in, was in uh, mud that was so saturated with water that we actually, when we stepped in it, our boots would sink in and it was like quicksand. But then somehow it was still dry about six or seven inches down below the hard pan. So that's when I really realized that over the years of rototilling uh, and plowing, I had developed a hard pan that was nearly impenetrable to water. And in this situation where we had so much water, we had nowhere to go, it was actually flowing across, across the landscape because it couldn't get down through that hard pan. So, um, so what th these are the biggest issues coming out of this past season that I saw I really needed to do something about, I really needed to address that what I've been doing up till now has not been working and I need to make some systematic changes to my operation to be able to continue. So because of that uh, significant amount of rain, I thought lack of water infiltration and poor tilth from tillage was really a problem. So I wanted to find out ways to get away from tillage. I also thought that rototilling had really caused me to proliferate my weed problems. And I didn't have good systems in place for being able to control weeds early in the season in that April, May, June timeframe when it's critical, critical to hit weeds when they're small um, because of low labor and low mechanization. And then also just having these short cultivation windows as we've experienced more climate volatility, there just seems to be shorter and shorter windows for, for being able to get things done. Um, and then a, a third issue is just how do, how do I build and maintain soil fertility and health with an intensive rototiller bed, bed based vegetable system without having to import expensive uh, inputs. And in my experience, a lot of the farms that are practicing this in kind of intensive use are using compost. And so they're either needing to produce that compost on the farm uh, or they're, they're needing to buy it. And I did buy compost for a number of years and I found it to be very expensive. So I wanted to work towards a system where I could uh, be rest, less reliant on, on uh, external inputs. So kind of my big limitations um, for, for addressing these issues are the, is that I, I, I don't own the tractor, the four-wheel tractor that I use, it's rented. Um, I do have the BCS uh, tractor that I own. Um, so I, with this rented tractor, I, I, wanted to, I didn't want to buy, purchase another tractor. I wanted to be able to use this tractor and I didn't necessarily want to buy a lot of specialized equipment or expensive equipment for the tractor. Um, also, uh, I, I wasn't interested in kind of the high labor, high input type systems, the more intensive systems, because I was interested in something that'd be less demanding on me, less demanding on the soil and, and uh, less requiring me to, to get outside help. I, in other words, I'm, I'm not necessarily looking to absolutely maximize my return per square foot. Um, my financial situation, my wife doesn't work on the farm. She has an outside job. I live in a shared house with three income producing adults. So my ability to produce income off the farm is necessary, but I don't necessarily need to produce uh, 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 a significant full-time income off the farm. So I was more interested in making the farm work for me and not necessarily maximizing my return from it. Um, so that gave me some more flexibility as to what kind of systems I would choose from. Also uh, with climate volatility, which I think we've been seeing, especially since I've started farming, I've, I've noticed increasing volatility in the weather uh, in my first year farming, we had both a flood and a drought in the same year. I found that there's just, there just seems to be always, I'm always in a rush to hit these short windows for doing soil prep, planting, weeding, cover cropping. Um, and when I'm doing things by hand, it's really hard to hit all the things I need to do in those windows. 
And so that's uh, another thing that sort of pushed me towards looking at doing things in a more mechanized way that would allow me to do things quicker in a shorter period of time. So in the course of considering these uh, issues and some of my limitations and also doing some research, I, I kind of um, uh, rediscovered Ridgetill. I, I'd known about Ridgetill for a number of years. It's, as uh, Steve mentioned, it's a pretty foundational practice for practical farmers of Iowa. It's primarily used in row crops, corn and soybeans. Um, but I started to, to wonder about how the system could be um, adapted to, uh, to vegetables. Um, and this is just a graphic kind of, for those of you who are unfamiliar with ridge till about what the basic principle is, but the idea with ridge till is that you build ridges. Um, initially you build ridges. So, um, uh, in most row crop systems, they would be about 30 inches apart, which is the typical row spacing for uh, corn or soybeans. Um, so you have that, uh, that ridge built, uh, the, let's say the previous year, and then going into the next year, uh, you use a, a blade or a furrower to kind of shave off the top of the ridge and put that soil in between the ridges. And so by doing that, you've thrown any weed seed that was on top of the ridge into the, into the between row area where it's easier to control because the between row areas are always easier to control than in row. So you shave off the top and you plant your crop. As your crop emerges um, out of that ridge and, and starts to grow, that's when you begin uh, cultivating and ridging. So you actually start to throw that soil back up into the, uh, into the row to rebuild the ridge. And as you're doing that, you're smothering any weeds that started in the row. And you're also um, uh, destroying weeds that are germinating between the rows. And you're also rebuilding your ridges. Um, and so then you've got a rebuilt ridge, you harvest that, you're leaving all your residue on the surface, you're not tilling. In the fall, so you're, you're leaving your, your soil covered with, so it's a high residue um, covered soil. And then in the spring, you're doing it all over again. So that's the basic um, uh, system for ridge till uh, for corn and soybeans. Um, so in the course of my research, I discovered a few farms, a few vegetable farms that were actually had taken on the, the, um, this notion and, and adapted it to diverse vegetables. So they were doing a similar uh, diversity of vegetables to me, which for me is, has been 30 to 40 crops um, to service a, a CSA and farmer's market um, customer base. So the, the, the farm that I, that I really have modeled a lot of what I've done on, um, off of is um, Hackmatack Farm in uh, Penobscot, Maine, which is Nicholas Lindholm. And uh, this is just a few pictures from his operation. Um, they also have a wild blueberry uh, U-Pick U operation. And, and I think they, they've, in recent years, they've, they've moved away from their vegetable operation and focused more on their, on their blueberry operation. Uh, this was the, um, there's a PDF that you can find online. So if you just search Ridge Till, Ridge Tillage, Hackmatack Farm, you can find this fact sheet that's uh, produced by the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. And it has a lot of great information. I'm going to kind of go through the highlights of that, um, but I would encourage you to read that. Um, they also have a, a fact sheet about how to build the Ridge Till toolbar that is used on Hackmatack Farm. And I'll go through how my toolbar, and it's fairly similar to theirs. But the basic idea of uh, Hackmatack's approach is um, uh, for every tractor pass, they're building two ridges. Um, and you can think of these as um, they're kind of like mini raised beds. So uh, ridge till is kind of like trying to take the advantages of both row cropping and raised beds and combine them into a hybrid system. So it's almost like you're creating two little raised beds. And um, the argument that uh, Nicholas makes is that when you do this, you create the amount of surface area um, in your field, which increases the 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 biotic zone because he's saying the top three inches of the soil is where most of the soil biota are working. So by increasing the surface area, you're increasing the, the amount of surface area for uh, decomposition and nutrient cycling to take place. Um, and you can also see that when you're raising up the soil, similar to when you're making a raised bed, you're creating a, in, an increased amount of topsoil right where you're planting your plant. Uh, this is um, how they form the ridges at Hackmatack Farm. It's just a simple toolbar with disc holters um, behind their, uh, their, their tractor, which is a little bit smaller than mine, but it's like a 30 to 40 horsepower tractor with uh, fairly narrow ag tires. And there's 26 inches between those ridges, so they're slightly narrower than a, um, a row crop uh, a situation, but, but not too far off. And you can see they kind of form a peaked ridge initially. Um, and this is just another graphic that he shows that some of the other advantages he sees of the ridge till system, which um, include that they warm up and dry out faster uh, in the spring, that they provide a kind of a rippled surface so they can break, um, break up wind a little bit and reduce wind erosion, 
And then they also had the advantage of like a raised bed is that they, um, they allow water to pool in between the, uh, the beds so that uh, your, your crops stay up out of the water, which I have found is a, is a clear advantage of raised beds in my system when I've had standing water. Um, so there's kind of three different ways that they plant on the ridges. Um, the first is that they will just take a, um, uh, like a, like a rake or a cultivator and just scalp the ridges and flatten it out. And then they'll transplant into it, but just a single row of like, let's say uh, onions or Swiss chard or kale or broccoli or something like that. Um, in other cases, they will flatten the ridge and then seed it um, with typically multiple rows, but anywhere from one to three rows of, um, of direct seeded vegetables. And then the third way they'll do it is they'll kind of take that double ridge and they'll fill in the middle and then they'll lay black plastic over it for their uh, warm season crops. So um, on the left, you can see the, um, that's the single row transplanted uh, of Swiss chard transplanted into a ridge. On the right, you can see that double ridge formation where they've just covered both ridges with the black plastic and filled in the middle with some soil amendments and then planted their crops down the middle. And then uh, this, these are ridges that have been flattened and then direct seeded with three rows. Uh, and in this case, it look, it's like a um, arugula or possibly spinach. And then this is, uh, I think, Nicholas harvesting on the bottom right. So those are the three ways that they plant their vegetables on the ridges. So even though that everything is on the same ridge spacing, there is some variation uh, as, as far as uh, how many rows per ridge and the spacing within the ridge. So the other farm that I took inspiration from was a beach grow farm, which is Eric and Ann Nordell in, in uh, Trout Run, North Central Pennsylvania. And they're fairly well known, um, uh, especially if you subscribe to Small Farm Journal, they've contributed a lot to that, but they're known for, um, uh, they have a horse powered farm um, and they uh, have pioneered a lot of uh, techniques around using horses for ridge till. Um, and so their basic way of doing things is they, they form a single ridge behind their horses. You can see their horses kind of walk in between each ridge and they form them with this double set of coulters. Um, and it's a fairly flat ridge, not, not quite as peaked as the, um, uh, the ridge at Hackmatack. And then this is in the fall. So they build the ridges in the fall that then they seed them with oats and then they cult a pack over that. Uh, and then they also will seed a single row down the middle between the, between the, uh, the actual ridges. So they'll seed a single row of oats um, in addition to the oats that they've spread um, by hand. And then this is what it should look like in the, in the fall going into the winter. Um, and, uh, and then in the spring, all, that, all those oats and, and uh, field peas will be, will be dead. They'll be winter killed right on top of the ridges. And so they'll take their uh, uh, um, a furrower or a, uh, uh, just a, um, a cultivator shank and they'll scrape off the top of the ridge. And they also have a cutting coulter disc to kind of cut through the residue to make sure it doesn't gum up the, the furrower to make their planting surface. And then this is them transplanting onions. And then this is what it looks like when they've, uh, this, is, this they said was a picture of a particularly hot and dry May, but these are the onions established on the ridges. And you can see in between they grow a, um, a crop of winter rye, um, which they actually then cut and use to mulch those onions, which is an interesting variation on this system. And I would also say that this, this uh, rye has the added advantage of acting as a windbreak for those onions as well. Um, they have a great publication called Weed the Soil, Not the Crop, which came out in 2009, which synthesizes a lot of things they learned over the years. Um, and it talks about their approach of every other year following um, and how they've used that to basically reduce their weed seed bank to zero. Um, and now they actually cultivate more to benefit the moisture for their crops because they don't irrigate than they actually do to cultivate to destroy weeds. Um, there's some great graphics in that, but there's a, a few that just show potential crop rotations for doing this uh, uh, one year cash crop, one year fallow. Um, and I'll just draw your attention to the one on the right because you can see the alternation of cash crops with, with cover crops, but also those dark slivers are, are periods of what are known as brown fallows, which are periods in which they're not growing a cover crop or a cash crop, but they're simply cultivating, allowing weeds to germinate, cultivating and killing the weeds, allowing them to germinate again and then cultivating again. And through multiple shallow cultivations, they're able to um, destroy weed seeds in their seed bank. And then by uh, continuing to till shallowly, they, they no longer bring up um, weed, seed, uh, weed seeds from lower down to replenish that weed seed bank. So um, 
I'm just going to run through uh, what I what I decided to do for ridge till at Middleway Farm. So um, for soil preparation, I, I, I'll use a disc, um, uh, shallow plowing if necessary, um, but but plowing really only in rotation every few years. Um, a disc or a bed width cultivator would be what I would use to work down the soil enough to be able to build up the ridges. And then I've also purchased a chisel plow that I, I'm using to kind of break through some of that uh, hard pan compaction that I've noticed and also use it to kind of pre-mark where the ridges will go. Uh, and then I built a, a ridge, built, uh, ridge till toolbar that's modeled off of Hackmatack farm that I'll show a little, in a few slides where I can build uh, two ridges behind, uh, between the tires of the tractors, a similar distance between the ridges as Hackmatack um, with the addition of, um, I've used the Cultipacker to actually flatten out those um, ridges similar to what the Nordells do um, rather than doing it by hand with a rake. And then uh, that toolbar also serves as my cultivator um, for the rest of the season. So I can use those mounding discs and the cultivators to control weeds between the ridges and also on the edges of the ridges, which could include aggressively mounding crops that will tolerate it, but also for crops that won't, using those mounding discs more as shields and then cultivating with just the shanks. Um, in row weeding, if I'm not mounting up, would still be accomplished by hand, but, but hopefully there would be less of it to do. Um, I will continue to use black plastic, um, which I've used for the last few years. So I'll, I'll, I'll do something similar to what Hackmatack does, where instead of um, uh, they, they cover over their two ridges with a single layer of plastic. Um, I use drip irrigation, so I'll, I'll continue to use drip irrigation on the ridges as needed. Both Hackmatack and uh, the Nordells um, tend not to use irrigation. And, and part of the reason they adopted this system was in order to conserve moisture in their soil so that they could get by without using irrigation. So I'm, I'm curious to see as I get into using this system whether I'll be able to reduce my irrigation use. And I am uh, incorporating a full season fallow every third year as part of this system where I will have the opportunity to do a brown fallow similar to what the Nordells do um, in order to try to get ahead of some of the weed problems that I've uh, developed over the years. Um, I won't go into too much detail about this, but I, I'm kind of working on a simplified crop rotation where I just have basically three different rotations. Uh, and in one year, I'm, I'm doing a double cropping. In the next year, I'm doing a single crop. And then in the third year, I'm following and growing a little bit of garlic. And then I'm repeating that. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm a little bit short on time. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. But I think that ridge till can help me address these big issues that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, water infiltration and, and reduced tillage. Uh, by using the chisels and the raised ridges, I think um, along with shallow cultivation, I think I can better preserve soil structure and also break up some of that hard pan and not rebuild it. Um, as far as weed proliferation, um, I think using the shallow tillage and being able to use the tractor to really <clears throat> be able to more efficiently uh, weed the farm and my interest really um, in ridge till kind of started with the with the idea I asked myself the question could I adopt a, a cultivation system that would allow me to cultivate the entire farm in an afternoon and uh, because that, that's sometimes all, all the time that I have to to do a cultivation and so I think with this system I can nearly achieve that if not in row weeding I can I can accomplish all of my between row and uh, um, and edge of ridge weeding in a single day with this with this system and then as far as building and maintaining soil fertility, um, the wider spacing that I would be using um, is less intensive on the soil. So I wouldn't be uh, growing as many plants per square foot. And then also more aggressively incorporating um, soil building cover crops into my rotation. Um, whereas before cover crops have sort of been a, an afterthought if I can fit them in when I can. Now I'm really starting to build my, my whole system around uh, when I can plant cover crops. So uh, this, just gonna show you the process of building the toolbar that I built. Um, this is when I was starting to assemble it. Um, uh, this is probably the best view of it. Um, so it, it's, it's basically two rows. Um, there's two, uh, two inch by two inch square tool, toolbars that uh, are connected together. And then the back toolbar has uh, two sets of hilling discs that make those two ridges. And between those, they have a, like a seven inch um, sweep. And then in the front, they also have like another seven inch sweep. So that's kind of cultivating the space between the, the ridges. And then you can see, I also have these um, 16 inch uh, buffalo cultivators. They're, they're kind of flattened buffalo cultivators. In this picture, they're in the up position. So they're in the just carrying position, but they can just be flipped over and bolted in and they'll, and they'll then be in the, um, 
in the cultivating position. The ones on the outside can be used to, to cultivate the tire tracks. The ones on the inside can be used to actually um, sweep the tops of the ridges. So actually to uh, level the ridges um, at the start of the year. Uh, there's just a few more views of uh, where those um, cultivators are. The nice thing about this toolbar is it's very modular. It's all just bolted together. So I can, I can take coulters on, take um, uh, sweeps on and off and do different configurations. So I can use this toolbar to um, also to dig potatoes. I also use this, this configuration that you're looking at to cultivate black plastic. So this allows me to um, cultivate between the black plastic and then also to mound soil up onto the black plastic to kill weeds on the edges. And I found this to be fairly effective last year. So that toolbar is very versatile for me. So it will, it will accomplish both ridge building, cultivating, and then also um, can be used to, uh, to uh, 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 dig as well by digging, digging potatoes. I used uh, Woodward Crossings um, and they have this uh, kind of system they call the Wonder Bar module, which is just a, it's a modular toolbar that you can build on. And, and I, I, I found myself using it just because I, I found them to be very, they had great customer service. They were very quick, accessible. Um, Hackmatech Farm uh, or, or the uh, main Organic uh, Farmer and Gardener Associ Association recommends Buckeye Tractor. They have similar equipment where they will sell you toolbars and, um, and individual pieces that you can use to piece together a toolbar because you'll have to build this. If you wanted to do something like this, you have to, you have to build it yourself. You can't buy anything that's pre-built for you. But I would, I would recommend looking at these two companies if you're interested. Um, I have a, just an old two-bottom plow that was my landlord's father's plow that I, that I will use um, to uh, incorporate a cover crop, a uh, thick cover crop, or, or um, to reset a plot in order to build ridges. So I'm, I'm not against using the plow. I think uh, it's, not, it's not to be used as an annual tool, but I think it has some use as a, um, in a rotation, in a tillage rotation. I've also purchased this uh, six foot wide disc, uh, just a toe behind six foot wide disc that, I, that will be what I'll use to, um, to prep soil in order to, uh, to ridge till. Um, so this was my first attempt at ridge tilling this past year. Um, this was a plot that was going to be planted into garlic and then um, the other half of it would just be prepped for the following spring so that the ridges are already built for the spring so I can then plant my early stuff like peas, potatoes, onions, and spinach. So um, this is my first attempt at ridge building. You can see the soil is very chunky and that's um, in large part because of how wet it was and how I really did not have an opportunity to work the soil uh, when it was dry enough. Um, and uh, in more ideal uh, situations, I would not have worked the soil when it was that wet, but I really did not have a choice if I wanted to plant a garlic crop, uh, garlic crop this fall because from August 20th on, really the soil never dried out to a point to a point at which I would, I would consider it normal, a normal amount of moisture to do this kind of tillage. So it was a little bit rough. Um, I may have compromised the soil quality a little bit in this plot, but I'm hoping to mitigate that um, over time with, with cover crops. Um, so these are the ridges right after they were built. And then I uh, use this cult packer, which is also another old piece of equipment from my uh, landlord's father to smooth down those ridges. You can see the, um, the, uh, the lines that are formed in the cult packer, which have the added advantage of actually being roll marks. So those kind of flatten down the, the ridges to um, make them a little bit easier to plant. Okay, so um, that's, a, that's a quick run through of what I'm doing um, and I'll be happy to take uh, some questions right now if anyone has them. I haven't been looking at um, the participant box and the chat box to see if any questions have been coming up. Awesome. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Jordan. Uh, I was gonna say, I don't see any questions in here now, but Brian, you can go ahead and pull up your presentation and if there's any questions that come up for Jordan in this uh, meantime right now, he can answer those. Otherwise, we will have questions for both Jordan and Brian after, uh, after Brian's done here.
Brian, I can see you pulling up your presentation here, but your mic is on mute, so I don't know if you're talking to us or not. Might have lost the, uh, looks like you might have lost the Zoom toolbar. That thing hides on you pretty easy, so <laughs> I'm sure it'll come up if you, um, yeah, it's either on the top or the bottom of your screen, I bet. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm having trouble. Um, no problem. I can for hear some you reason now. navigating around here, but I'm, I'm going to try this again and, and uh, okay. we'll see if it works. So okay. my apologies on this here. No problem. Yeah. So I can see your full screen and, um, and so I saw your PowerPoint was back there somewhere. Yeah. If you open up your PowerPoint, program and go back to your first slide instead of from the current one if you go back start from beginning there we go is that where you wanted to start it looks like that'll come up here in just a sec no okay are we, what do you guys see now and uh well it's loading right now either that or it's just a black screen Oh, now I got it. It's on reduced tillage, deep zone till is the slide that we're on. Full screen, so it's huh. it's good there, but it's on, yeah, reduced tillage, deep zone. So I don't know if that's the, there we go. That's the be beginning. Okay, now is it on re ridge tillage vegetables? Yeah, all right. We're good to go. Okay. <laughs> cool. Thanks, okay, Brian. this is, boy, that was, I, we knew that was going to be a little bit of a tricky transition there, but it was it was definitely worse than I was expecting. No, um, that's fine. What's going this on? Is, it's okay. worth that. It's worth the, worth, <laughs> worth the trouble from having you from New York talk to us. Okay. Well, anyways, here we go. So, um, yeah, I, I'm really, uh, really pleased um, with being here. Uh, we, the Practical, Far Practical Farmers of Iowa is, is definitely well known amongst the organic community here in New York State. And, and I, I feel like really privileged to be working with you folks and, and uh, appreciate seeing Jordan's Jordan's thoughts and and uh, and what he's doing. What we did uh, at Cornell is a little bit different, and uh, we had an experiment that started in 2005 and ran through 2014. And that's the information that I'm going to be uh, uh, going over with you now. And the, basically, uh, we're looking at ridge tillage in, in a lot of our work uh, through this lens of. Um, Reduced tillage is not, uh, we don't think of it usually as a goal in, a, in and of itself, but it's, it's a means toward an end, uh, and that is all about long-term productivity and reducing uh, any negative environmental impacts. And along with that, there is also sometimes a reduction of fuel use uh, that, that goes with it too. But uh, these are the things that are driving it and, and the, the different types of tillage that we're looking at, the different systems are, are sort of we're, we're trying to attain these goals. So in addition to the ridge tillage, we're also looking at zone tillage. And this slide kind of just is a pretty nice graphic that shows, shows uh, sort of the, the, the different approaches. And the, the ridge tillage, as you see there, um, let's see, does... Um, uh, Steve, tell me if, if my uh, cur cursor is showing up. I think it does, but yep. essentially, yeah. Yep, we got we, it. We, we, uh, if, we, if we start in a situation we already have uh, the ridges, basically the only, the only things that we're doing in terms of tillage is removing that top section of the ridge and throwing it in the valley or basically returning it to the top. So we're just playing with a, with a relatively... Uh, narrow slice of soil and kind of moving it sideways back and forth to um, either uh, slice, the, uh, you know, to scrape our ridges or, or to recreate them. And so this is, this is our, our approach to it. And 
I'm going to go through this a little bit more uh, at the end of the talk, but it's it's quite different in, in some specific ways than than what um, Jordan and what uh, uh, Nicholas uh, Lindholm have done, because we are are using the ridges. We're having the ridges in place basically during the the winter cover crop season, and in the summertime when our cash crop is there, we are just scraping the ridges and we're growing the um, the, the vegetable crop in the, on the scraped ridge. So it's a much shallower ridge, as you can see in, in this picture. Uh, our, our rows are 30 inches in these experiments. Um, sometimes uh, you'll see some pictures of winter squash, in which case we only planted every other row. So we, we had 60 inches between the winter squash, but our other vegetables were on 30 inch rows. And our rotation in this experiment was, was a winter squash and lettuce and potatoes and cabbage. Those, those four crops were in the rotation. Now, the reason that we chose this, um, this approach to, to ridge tillage uh, is slightly, uh, it goes back to the, the um, slide that Jordan showed of the sort of the classic row crop ridge tillage. And we, we followed that model, except that, uh, especially for things like lettuce, and winter squash, we couldn't, we couldn't see how we could ridge those with a cultivator. And so we didn't, we didn't build up the ridges during the um, season. We just grew it on a flat culture and, you know, or nearly flat culture. And we, we could not uh, see exactly how we would, how we could plant say high on a ridge and then do the weed management without scraping a lot of soil out and damaging roots and that sort of thing. So that's, those were the reasons that we went for this kind of approach which essentially is a near flat culture in the cash crop. And then the ridges were used for the, the cover crops. So this is a Sukup uh, uh, ridge scraper unit. Uh, these were available in the uh, uh, Midwest in particular in the, in the 80s and 90s. I don't think they make them anymore, but we got a hold of some and that's what we used to scrape the ridges. This is what it looked like. This is a hairy vetch cover crop that uh, we, we mowed it and then we scraped it. And it's, kind of, it's not a really elegant <laughs> looking, looking um, situation uh, at that point. But one thing I want to I wanna just mention while, we, while we're looking at this here, and that is in terms of killing um, uh, hairy vetch as a, as a, as a cover crop and, and being able to manage it, it's very sensitive to, to driving over with tractor tires. So when we went through and, and, uh, and made these, we did two rows, uh, we straddled two rows at a time with our tractors. We made, when we scraped these ridges, we would, we would be um, driving over two of the, of the you know, the, the, the remaining par, uh, strips of, of hairy vetch that were alive and killing them. And then we'd actually like take the tractor with no, no implements, on it, implements on it and just drive over the middle two rows uh, of the middle two strips of, of vetch to kill that. And it worked really well. So this is the kind of situation that, that we would typically uh, get after, after you know, a couple of weeks and the, the, the vetch is dead. You can still see some residue there. Uh, you can see the sort of flattish ridges that, that we planted our, our cage into. So we could manage that pretty well um, with this approach. Now, this, this shows how we made our ridges. Um, we, these are potato hillers, and we just use them um, to recreate the ridges and throw that soil from the valleys up on top of the ridges. And that was bef done before, um, well, it was it, usually the way we did it is we drilled the cover crop first in the, um, in the near flat ground, and then we would create the ridges. And believe it or not, um, we, could, we could throw that soil around and still get a nice catch of the of the uh, cover crop. Usually, um, rye and vetch were the typical overwintered cover crops uh, that we used, uh, and it would work pretty well. It would be a little bit sparser in the valleys, as you can imagine, because we're throwing the soil out of there. But there was still uh, some seeds and soil would drift back down, I guess, and and uh, allow for for a decent um, uh, cover crop establishment, even in the valleys, and then good establishment on top. Okay, so the experiment that we were, we were um, into uh, had four different approaches to organic uh, cropping systems. 
And what I, what we're going to see if a little bit of the results here. And in particular, we want to um, compare the ridge till performance in these, in these uh, usually charts and graphs to what we call the intermediate cropping system. And in that case, uh, these were very comparable except for ridge tillage being used in the ridge till system and moldboard plowing being used in the, in the intermediate cropping system. They had very sim they had the same um, cash crops, planting dates and rotation. Uh, the, the cover crops were sometimes a little bit different because we wanted to, in the um, ridge till system, we would often use oats instead of rye because the oats would winter kill and the rye is sometimes more difficult to kill in a, in a reduced cropping situ or reduced tillage situation. Uh, same fertilization, and uh, we cultivated uh, with um, a, a belly-mounted two-row cultivator setup, uh, usually with, with uh, standard side, side knives, uh, and sometimes with uh, the kind of sweeps that, that uh, Jordan showed us. And um, we would, in, in for each of these crops, there would generally be one hand hoeing per season uh, if things got out of hand for whatever reason, we might go through a second time, but generally it's just once. So again, looking at the, um, at the uh, intermediate, which is circled, and then uh, we took separate data on, the, on both the ridges and the valleys for aggregate stability. And the, where it says the EP1 and EP2, we had two entry points in the rotation each year. So we had two different crops each year. And this just shows, portrays both of those. But the key thing here is that, is that the, the, um, the, uh, ridge, the ridge till system consistently had better aggregate, soil aggregate stability than, than any of the other ones, and in particular, the intermediate that sets its direct um, comparison. Uh, the intensive, just quickly, the intensive is kind of what you would imagine with a sort of a non-cover crop based, compost based uh, intensive vegetable system with double cropping two out of the four years. The extensive, extensive system was um, modeled on Eric and Nan Nordell's uh, program that, that uh, Jordan uh, described. Okay, so we saw the aggregate stability. That's great. That's kind of what we were shooting for. But we ran into some, some issues that I think uh, will become sort of clear what was going on. And, and I think they are going to make a good argument for using Jordan's approach and Nicholas Lindholm's approach rather than exactly what we did, exactly copying what we did at Cornell. So you can see here the, the ridge till, uh, early season growth on the squash was way less than in some of the other treatments. And this is just, uh, uh, you know, sampling in, in July, which is just when things are starting to run, um, the plants were much smaller. And we saw a similar thing with lettuce. It's not quite as extreme, but once again, the ridge till plants, when we, when we took a sort of early season measurement, just didn't get off to that, that good start. And uh, I think the reason for that was that um, we were planting them on sort of the stumps of the ridges, you know, like, like the, we've scraped the tops off the ridges and we're planting those on this untilled, uh, sort of uh, truncated uh, stump. And, and what that's all about is that uh, because there was uh, no tillage, the soil was, was somewhat uh, compacted over, over time. It was just like a tighter soil. And you could, you could feel that when you were, if you had to like um, uh, do any hand cultivation or fix plants that were transplanted that, that weren't in the ground right or something like that, you could, you could definitely feel that it was, it was a tighter soil there. So, some um, lack of, of uh, you know, sort of loose soil for the plants to get started with. Also, if you think about it, we have taken the, the, the active portion of the soil with all those cover crop roots and, and things, and we've thrown it to the side. And, and, um, <laughs> and also sometimes we, we would be applying uh, pretty light rates, but, but significant rates of, of uh, of a, pellet, of a pelletized chicken manure product as part of our fertility, and that would tend to get thrown to the side as well. So these, we didn't give the plants a good start. And that's, that's a, an important lesson from all this and a good, a good um, argument for actually not, not uh, plant, you know, growing into the, exactly the same way that we did. 
Now, the other thing that we ran to was, was much bigger uh, biomass in the ridge to system. And that there's a higher, uh, let's see if I have, no, there's a higher diversity of weeds and a higher biomass of weeds in the ridge till. And I'll get back to that. Um, and you can see once again, uh, Jordan was talking about the Nordell's uh, bioextensive system with it that uses a, a cash crop only every other year. And, and we used uh, mostly uh, cover crops and not so much of the bear fallow in between, but you can really reduce your, your weed seed bank. Uh, in that approach. Quick, quick uh, sort of like a uh, tour through one season of, of what these crops look like. And again, always on the left is going to be the ridge till plot and, and on the right is going to be the intermediate. And this is winter squash, um, delicata winter squash that we grew as the cash crop. So a couple of weeks after, maybe three weeks after transplanting, uh, they're just getting started and a little bit stronger on the, on the um, intermediate, but it's not so obvious in this picture, but there, um, when the plants are running, you can you can see that the the intermediate the plants are definitely more vigorous, you know, a bit more vigorous. Everything looks pretty good, but these are more these are getting a better start. Hey and Brian, then, uh, Brian, yeah. this is Steve. Just real quick, some of these slides that have um, kind of a high quality image on it, we're about ten seconds behind you, so just make sure that. Um, you oh. don't go through too quick because I can see, I can hear you clicking the slides and talking about it and then takes us okay. a few seconds, just in case you're going to go through these real fast, just so you know, we're a little, we're a little delayed. Great. Yes. Thank you for telling me. And my internet connection here is not really good. So we're, we're, you know, New York state is, uh, has a lot of really rural areas <laughs> and we are in the rural part. Let me go just very quickly here, but back, um, Again, the, the, the earliest part of the season, uh, not too much of a difference, um, but you know, uh, probably the intermediate ones look a little darker and probably are getting off to a little better start. But here, I hope you guys have gotten this now, uh, by uh, mid-July, uh, clearly uh, good growth on both, but better growth on the intermediate. And I'm going to wait a second here, but by um, early August, you're starting to see, um, I think the, again, the, the plants look a little thicker here. And we, we see some weeds here. We don't see maybe quite as many weeds in the ridge till, but in uh, a couple more weeks, now the, the weeds are starting to really break through the, the ridge till. And we do have some, you know, some weeds in, in our um, in intermediate as well, but this is this is producing a higher yield than than the the um, the ridge till. And then by the end of the season, you can see that again, there's there's significant weeds in the intermediate uh, that have gone to seed, but there's a lot of weeds here that have gone to seed in the um, in the ridge till. And a lot of these weeds in the ridge till, in addition, are uh, winter annual weeds like chickweed and uh, um, shepherd's purse and that sort of thing. Um, there was definitely more diversity of weeds uh, in the, in the uh, ridge till and, and a few perennial weeds as well. So Steve, quickly, is that, is, are the sl slides catching up to me? Am I, is this yep. okay? Yep, that speed okay. is just fine. Okay, good, yeah. Okay, so a, a few thoughts about this weed buildup that we saw in our ridge till. And I think that, that these, this could be instructive for Jordan as well. Um, we definitely, uh, the, we had the more diversity that I, that I mentioned, but I think a big, a big reason for all this is that when we scraped um, the top of the ridges, right along the edge of that scraped zone, I think sometimes we had escaped weeds that we didn't quite get. And it doesn't take very many of those to then, if they go to seed, uh, you know, during the, the cropping season, um, you know, sometimes then they're, you know, bigger than, than uh, it's hard to kill them with your cultivation. Um, and again, it just takes a few. And if they go to seed, then you start to get behind the eight ball and you are building up your, your um, weed seed bank. And I think that, I think that's what we ran into. We never, we never really nailed it down exactly why 
there were more, uh, more diversity and more weeds in the ridge till, but we certainly observed that. Another, another say, uh, aspect that I don't understand really very well is that in spite of the fact that, that the um, um, soil health was probably a little better in the, um, in the ridge till uh, plots, you remember back to that aggregate stability slide where it was always better. And this is just looking at the, at the cover crop biomass uh, in these plots. And that was when they were actually in the ridge conformation, you know, full ridges uh, conformation. Uh, I would have thought that our, that our biomass would have been uh, just as good in the ridge till, but it was, it was a little less. So that's, and I don't know what, why that is either. Um, so that was something to think about as well. Um, and finally, we did some economics on all this. And this, what this chart here is all about is like we, we figured out our net returns. This is with economic budget models. This is, you know, of course, you know, with a lot of assumptions in it, uh, but take that, you know, as, with a grain of salt. But we, we uh, figured out our net returns and then we had um, took, keep tr kept track of, of all our, our hours of labor uh, for uh, hand weeding. And, and we also, in the model, we estimated uh, harvest labor and, and uh, packing and that sort of thing. Uh, long story short, uh, in the first four-year rotation, the uh, ridge till basically did quite well as, uh, if you just divide the total net income by the total number of hours, okay? That's, that's what this is. So whether it was the owner or a paid worker or whoever, we just counted that as an hour of labor and we totaled those up and divided the, the net return uh, by those total hours. So I think that's actually a nice metric because um, uh, you know, if, if this number was like 35 or, or $40 an hour, and, and even if you had paid labor that you're paying $15 an hour or 20, you're still making out all, all right. But this shows um, that we were down around the $20 an hour for all these systems in the first rotation. Um, and in the second rotation, the net return went down a little bit for everything, but it went down a lot in the ridge till. And I think we, we uh, you know, experienced um, some, some lower yields and, and, uh, and partially because of more weeds and that sort of thing. Uh, so that, that was not, not a strong uh, show of support for, for the, the way that we did it. And again, I'm gonna, um, um, I'm gonna say that, that I think that the, the version that, uh, that Nicholas uh, and Jordan are doing is, it, it makes a lot more sense as long as you can figure out a good way of mechanical cultivation of the weeds on the ridges. That's, I still am a little bit hung up on that. Um, but we didn't investigate it because we, we thought it was gonna be a difficult situation. But again, looking at this quickly, um, in, I'm, I'm calling the, 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 the system that Jordan essentially is using, the, the NL system for Nicholas Lindholm. And in that one, uh, of course, the ridges are, are used during the cash crop. In the organic, the Cornell Organic Cropping Systems uh, project, uh, the ridges were basically made during the cover crop. And what happens when, when the, using the NL system, you're, you are essentially doubling the amount of topsoil for the crop by throwing all that, that, uh, that extra topsoil up right on where the crop is growing, whereas we actually negated that advantage uh, to a great degree. Um, we grew these cash crops on the ridge bases. Uh, there's less topsoil there, the soil was tighter. Uh, and I mentioned this uncertainty about, about uh, the cultivation tools, which is why we did this. Uh, another difference is that at least Nick, Nicholas Lindholm, uh, he uses the moldboard plow every third year before the cover crop. We, we never used any, any, um, anything but ridge tillage. And we grew a, a cover crop every winter uh, after the main crop uh, to you know, provide uh, biological activity and, and uh, nitrogen fixation, that's, that sort of thing. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention too was that uh, our soil uh, at the research farm, uh, the Cornell's research farm at Freeville is, is very well drained. 
it's a gravelly silt loam. You guys would be stunned at the number of stones in the soil and you wonder how you could ever grow anything there, but, but stuff grows there and it, the drainage is good. So we didn't have any issues with, with uh, moisture in the valleys, but that can be a, an important uh, aspect of this. So again, keeping, keeping the eyes on the prize, going back to that first slide, I was like, well, what are we trying to do here? Um, we need to think about all these, all these approaches in terms of, of uh, basically uh, enhancing soil quality, reducing you know, environmental, negative environmental impacts. And of course, we also want to have a profitable system and uh, you know, be able to produce good crops. So I think I want to um, pause it there and my screen is just not, oh, here we go, here we go. Um, my uh, toolbar has moved up to, the, up to the top. I don't think we have any questions and answers, but um, uh, Steve, are you, uh, are you getting anything or do you, can you think of any questions? No, I was going to say that, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we've still got 20 minutes left for the evening and I don't see any questions in the Q&A box yet, but just to remind folks that in their um, Zoom toolbar, there is an icon that says Q&A. You can click on that and ask your questions now because we're going to run out of time real quick if we get in our questions too late. So go ahead and start getting your questions in there. And okay. I think Jordan might have something to kick us off with if you want. Otherwise, um, if you've got some more content, you can go, you know, another five minutes or so. Yeah, Brian, I, before you um, moved on, I just wanted to, um, if you could just briefly describe a little bit the extensive system um, in that comparison you were doing um, yeah. and just how that, comp like how that was different from the Ridge Till in what you were doing. Yeah, so the extensive system that we used uh, uh, was, was um, uh, again, based on, on some of what the Nordells are doing, uh, but we, a lot of what they do doesn't use ridge tillage and, and does, you know, they use a lot of mold board plowing with their horses and we just were focused on that part. So, so basically the, the big difference is that, um, that uh, we were just growing a, a cash crop every other year. So our, our uh, rotation for, uh, for the extensive system um, for the, you know, was, was um, used winter squash and then a cover crop year and then lettuce and then a cover crop year. Did not, we did not grow potatoes or cabbage in, in the ocean at all, which kind of makes it a tricky uh, scientific in comparison, but that's, that's the only way we could figure out how to do it. Um, but, but just a standard tillage um, uh, and then establishing, trying to, to um, make, we used, made extra efforts with, uh, with hand weeding to, to, and sometimes with cultivation to ensure that, that very, very few weeds would go to seed in, in that system. And that was part of the, part of the whole idea was to really, um, you know, reduce that um, weed seed bank, and then just grow cover crops in between, um, often oats and peas, uh, buckwheat sometimes, uh, and then rye and vetch, and then come back into the into the cash crop every other year. So is that that's a very bare bones. We only used half as much fertility on those because we didn't put any extra fertility on the cover crops. Only only the, the only on the, the cash crops. So because there was only uh, cash crop every two years, we only used half the fertility uh, on that one. So is that, is that enough, uh, Jordan? Uh, I, you, I, anything else you want a uh, clarification on, I'm, I'm glad to give it. Yeah, the only other question I have for the, that extensive system is so otherwise you were doing the, the every other year fouling, but otherwise you were using conventional tillage similar to the intensive or the intermediate system? Yeah, conventional okay. tillage and the standard, standard cultivated, you know, cultivation equipment um, yeah, and, and then one hand hoeing, same, same deal. But, but sometimes there would be an extra hand hoeing or, or extra like weed roguing sometimes if mm -hmm. we, late in the season, if like in, in the squash, if, if uh, three weeds were threatening to, to go to seed. Yeah, I see there's a, there's a, a question here and I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna read this here. It's, um, what are each of your go-to cover crops for spring and summer? And boy, um, I guess I'll, I'll start with this. Um, but um, 
it all depends on your purpose, of course. Um, and boy, I mean, oats and peas are great. We, they do very well for us if we plant them in very early spring. We can get good biomass by the end of June. Um, we grow buckwheat as a weed uh, suppressive smother crop. Um, some years actually uh, in, the, in the, I guess it's not spring and summer, but in late, late summer, uh, one year we had a really nice success toward the end of the experiment with um, growing a mixture of, uh, of mustard and uh, forage turnip uh, as brassica weed suppressive uh, cover crops in, in that extensive system. And the, the only weeds that we really couldn't deal with in the bioextensive system was chickweed and some of the winter annuals. And, and since in that system, we didn't have the cabbage, we felt pretty good about, about growing brassica uh, fall cover crops. And that really suppressed the, um, the chickweed in the, uh, almost 100%. So that was kind of a neat, neat uh, uh, insight. But, um, but I, I guess I would almost say that, that I don't really have um, favorite spring and summer uh, cover crops. It really depends on, on the, you know, exactly what you want to accomplish, uh, whether you want nitrogen fixation or weed suppression, that sort of thing. So uh, Jordan, I don't know if you, if you want to add to that. Yeah. Um, well, hi, Eric. Uh, so I think um, the, I can think of kind of three maybe different windows during that time. So the first window would be wanting to get a cover crop in as early as possible in the spring so that you can get some sort of ground cover and some biomass growth before you want to plant in, let's say, May or June. So like your warm season crops. And so in that case, I think oats and peas and field peas are a good choice and just get them planted as soon as possible. So as soon as the soil can be worked in March or early April and uh, try to give them as much time as possible to grow. Um, in the case where you would, uh, and then I think also oats and peas would work great for a longer window, uh, uh, like Brian just mentioned, where if you're, if, you're, if you're wanting to plant like a fall crop in July and get that in as early as possible, you can let it grow all the way up through the end of June where it will produce a lot of biomass right until the oats are just about to, uh, are starting to form heads. So I think that's, those are good options. Um, for a summer cover crop, I can think of a summer crop, summer cover crop being an in-between crop between a spring and a fall crop or just a cover crop after you're done with your spring crops. And I, you can't beat buckwheat uh, as a very quick summer cover. Basically, it can be planted any time between uh, May and I'll even plant it as late as September and let it winter kill. Um, it flowers within 30 days. Uh, it can be killed with mowing um, if, you, uh, if you mow it right when it's heading out. Um, I've also used after garlic, for example, as kind of a summer going into fall cover crop. I've done a mix of buckwheat, Japanese millet, and crimson clover. And I like that because the, um, the buckwheat would, would come up quickly and act as kind of a nurse crop for the other two. And uh, the buckwheat would flower and mow that, and that would die. And then the millet would kind of come in as a grass, and the crimson clover would continue growing as well as a legume. And I like that combo. I like that combo of having a forb, like a buckwheat, a cereal like millet, and a legume like crimson clover. So I've, I've tried to toy with putting together different cover crop mixes for different scenarios based on those three. Um, but that's, yeah, that's my two cents on that. That's great. Steve, any, any, uh, any more thoughts on, on, these, uh, on what we've seen so far? No, I'm I'm surprised by the the quiet group in the chat box tonight. Usually we get some questions <laughs> by now, so don't be shy, folks. Um, it, so I, we can. Looks like there's a couple more coming in. Um, I have. I guess I have one question though that I came up with, Brian, while you were while you were talking about your system. So Jordan's talking about um, he's um, he, he puts uh, as far as irrigation goes on these ridges. He puts drip tape and correct me if I'm wrong Jordan but you're going to continue to drip tape I think probably well it, it might depend on your crop but uh, down every ridge do you worry about that ridge drying out any quicker than um, you know than the typical infield planting and um, Brian did you guys do any sort of irrigation on your experiments at all? Well I guess I'll, I'll answer yes we, we used overhead irrigation we didn't use okay. drip so yeah. 
and I've considered whether it would make sense to go to to overhead. It's just uh, I'm in a situation now where I'm uh, uh, I'm now using rural water, and so I'm trying to conserve irrigation water as much as possible or eliminate it where possible. Which is another reason that uh, kind of the the Nicholas Lindholm system, where they where that was also a goal of theirs, is attractive to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So there's another another question about: Are there a couple of of crops, and I think this means cash crops, that either of you would recommend experimenting with or starting with ridge tillage? And I think that's a great question because it seems to me that that uh, like for instance, if you're growing sweet corn, you could just totally transfer the the uh, standard ridge tillage methods of, and you could hill hill them up and. Same thing might be true, uh, and maybe potatoes, the, the way that uh, Jordan grows them would be a good cro uh, crop to start with, uh, where it's pretty straightforward, it's you know, not such a big difference between the uh, tillage and, and standard approach. Yeah, potatoes, corn, um, uh, I've, any crop that will, will tolerate mounding, I think would be a good, a good one to try. I mean, that's, that's what I'm kind of interested in is how, how I can use uh, mounding as a as a method of weed control whenever possible. So leaks would be a good one because they uh, you, you often mound those anyway to blanch the stems. Um, I believe celery could be another one good one for that because you often uh, mound soil to blanch the stems. And then my understanding is that the the more up not not things like cabbage, but the more upright brassicas like um, uh, kale, broccoli possibly cauliflower will tolerate some mounding around the stem. They will root out from their stem. Um, and I think the same goes with uh, uh, tomatoes. Although uh, for me, I grow, I, I, I grow those in black plastic, so they don't really apply. Yeah. Sweet. Someone just mentioned sweet potatoes would be another good one. So basically any crop that will, that you can, that you can kind of find a consensus on will tolerate mounding, I think would be good for a ridge tool system because you can just go ahead and aggressively throw soil up into the row and that takes care of the biggest issue that Brian has pulled out, which is how do you control those weeds in row if you can't, if you're not able to rebuild the ridges? Yeah, and, and so Jordan, maybe you might give a couple thoughts and you, you know a lot more about what uh, Nicholas uh, uh, Lindholm was doing, but how, how do you manage weeds? Like he, he grows double rows on the ridges of, of uh, you know, salad greens and things like that. Um, how, what pr approach do you use with sort of with mechanical cultivation for that? Well, I guess um, uh, I think he's still using quite a bit of hand hoeing in that case. So uh, using things like a uh, collinear hose or wire hose to do the, the in between, in between those double rows and maybe doing um, in row weeding. I know for me, I tend not to weed direct seeded greens uh, or direct seeded um, like fast growing crops. Um, because I just don't find that they come, they're usually in and out within 30 days. And unless the weed pressure is really bad, I, I try to just get away without weeding them. Um, but at, my approach is gonna be, yeah, to mound the crops that I can. The ones that I can't mound is to try to be as aggressive as possible with my cultivation. And I, I mentioned that I've, uh, I'm, I'm going to experiment with uh, turning the, straightening out those disc coulters. So instead of having them in the hilling position, just having them in a straight position so that they act as a, a kind of a rolling shield and then try to be fairly aggressive with my, my outside cultivators um, so that I can get everything except the ridge top itself. And then I'll have to go through with the ridge top and, and do a quick run with a, with a collinear hoe or a, or a wire hoe or, or possibly even a wheel hoe. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, yeah, that's, so that, that's really the, the approach I'm looking at right now with uh, the crops that I can't mound um, the other thing that I'm looking at, and you'll, if you'll, you'll notice in the pictures I showed from Nicholas uh, Lindholm system that they use mulch fairly extensively. So I think they're typically going in and trying to get in one or two cultivations and then mulching. And uh, that's something I'm considering too, is, is to, to try to maybe go in and get for, especially for the longer, the crops that are in longer, like onions, um, to try and go in and get a couple of good cultivations and then get them mulched so that I'm not trying to, uh, control weeds the entire season on bare soil. Hmm. 
So I, I don't think I have time to show uh, some more slides of, of some of the other work that we're doing at Cornell, but I, I guess I want to throw out there that it seems like, first of all, I want to want to say that that the doing hand weeding in, in the kind of the loose soil that's that's on top of those ridges is a much better prospect than doing it on the on the, the scraped ridge bases. So that I think that's a really good thing. It's you know working doing hand weeding with with uh, you know, it makes a big difference whether the soil is tight or loose. So I think that's a real plus with um, you know even if you're not doing as much tractor cultivation uh, by growing your crops in, in ridges, it might, the hand labor might be actually quicker and easier because of the loose soil in the, in the, in the ridge top. So that's nice. Uh, and I want to just throw out there that, <coughs> excuse me, Jordan, you've used uh, um, tarps in some of your other work. It seems like tarps could be fit into this system probably in really beneficial ways. I think that's true. Um, I think the only issue I'm having right now is um, part of uh, switching over to ridge stills. I'm actually going to be reorienting my fields so to be a little bit longer so that I have fewer turnarounds with the tractor. And by doing that, I'm my, I'm going to end up with uh, the tarps formerly covered an entire bed length and now they will be short of the bed length. So I'm kind of considering, well, uh, do I want to try to just piece together multiple tarps in order to cover the entire ridge in the in the new longer bed configuration so that's the one thing i'm trying to work out in my head right now i think you're correct about that this could be used um to my advantage that uh during periods where the cash crop isn't growing the other thing i'm um kind of interested in doing i don't know if anyone here is familiar with um never sink farm in new york uh, connor crickmore and he uses a full-on no no-till system or low-till system but one of the things that he uses really extensively is flame weeding where he will prep a bed and then he will just continue to flame weed it until he's ready to plant it. And I found that concept kind of intriguing to keep beds sort of at a blank slate or, or to prep them and then to just kind of keep them there. And so I think I am going to experiment a little bit with uh, using my, um, uh, uh, the weed torch I have to just torch the ridge tops of, of plantings uh, be, between plantings to sort of hold them in place. And as another strategy for, um, uh, for controlling weeds previously, I've used flame weeding mainly for carrots where I'll, uh, plant the carrots and then flame weed right before they emerge. And that's pretty much all I've used it for, but I'm considering whether, uh, it would be useful to do that. Um, uh, just to, uh, uh, sort of in the same way that tarps are being used to, to kind of kill weeds in between crops. Yeah, I, I think I think that we've got to um, sort of use all the tools at our disposal here, and, and certainly uh, I, I think flaming. People get sometimes worried about whether flaming does damage to the, the the soil microbes, but I think it does a lot less than than like even a tine weeding would do. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's it's actually a pretty light um, light touch, and so uh, absolutely I think flame flame weeding is a really a really good another tool to add into these mix and. Really, um, the weeds, you know, are our friends in some ways, but they're mostly they're not. <laughs> so we have to figure out, uh, you know, as many ways of of, uh, of reducing them as, as possible. So I see a question uh, uh, from Casey. Have you ever tried green beans with the ridges? And I'll say that I I haven't because I haven't really the only thing I've planted ridge till so far is garlic last year, but I am planning to grow green beans and also I'll do maybe a couple crops of uh, edamame or fresh soybeans. And, and I'm kind of under the assumption that as a legume and also peas as well, that they will, they will tolerate a little bit of mounding. Um, and uh, another thing is I bought a rotary hoe uh, this fall, which is a, um, a tool that has a lot of uh, uh, basically circular metal spiked wheels that it's a full, it's a blind cultivation tool. So it's uh, you just drive it behind the tractor and it's often used in soybeans um, so that you can just blind cultivate soybeans and that they will tolerate that up to a certain uh, uh, growth. And so I'm, I'm kind of considering using that rotary hoe on my legumes, but yeah, also using ridges. And I, I, I don't know, Brian, if you, because you, of the crops that you use, I don't think you, you had any legumes. No. No, we didn't. In in the in the uh, intensive um, 
rotation, we added uh, peas, spring snap, uh, snap peas, uh, and spinach and fall spinach uh, as you know some of the double crops. But those were you know minor crops that you know we didn't have for most of the experiment. You know the other three treatments didn't grow those. Uh, another question from uh, Kristen, uh, using interested in the method mentioned at Beach Grow Farm for mulching the cash crop with cut rye. Did did or will either your, of your system try something like that? I'm in the last couple of days. I've actually been considering that because um, as I was preparing for this presentation, I was going back through um, small farm journal articles from the Nordells, and um, uh, and looking at um, what they've been doing. And I noticed the way that they were doing that kind of alley cropping with the rye. And so I went back into my farm plan and I sort of considered whether that would make sense. So I'm still kind of uh, determining the logistics of that because you have to kind of configure your field so you'll have your rye growing next to your, the crop that you want to mulch in order to, I think, logistically make that work. Because they were doing that by hand where they would cut the rye and then just move it over by hand. And I think that only makes sense if you've got it right next to each other in the field, but then it has to fit with your rotation. So I'm, I'm kind of toying with my head about that. And then the other reason I really like that method too is because I think the rye provides some uh, wind cover and, I, and I'm on top of a, of a, of a ridge where I'm at and uh, with, with very little uh, wind cover. And so I'm, I'm interested in uh, the possibility of using taller cover crops uh, to act as a windbreak. Um, and I think that rye would, would certainly accomplish that if you grew it in that kind of method of between alleys. Great. Well, this is a perfect um, <laughs> uh, segue for me, but uh, when we're right at the end, I'll show you this, this one little last slide. Steve, are we still looking at my slides? Yep, yep, we got it. Yeah. Okay, so you can see this picture here. Uh, what, what we're looking at is, is um, figuring out ways to grow uh, high biomass cover crops in place. So what the, this what this is all about, and I could, I'm not going to spend more than a second, but uh, we we grow uh, very high biomass um, uh, winter winter rye, oftentimes rye and vetch, uh, mow it like this with a rotary uh, with an offset uh, flail mower, and then move it to the side with um, with uh, row uh, row cleaners, and we can we can use that mulch and grow vegetable crops in it. So that I'm, I'm really glad I got, I'm glad somebody asked that and I got a chance to uh, show these, these last pictures. This is some of our more, more recent uh, research and I think that that's it's a really intri intriguing direction to go in. Yeah, so Brian, what would real quickly some of those high biomass cover crops be like, like rye, anything else? Yeah, well, so we, we were, um, Rye was pretty much the grass component, and then and then we would uh, grow rye by itself, or which is problematical in a lot of ways. Just you probably all know that um, it, it tends to tie up soil nitrogen and maybe allelopathic, et cetera. So it, sometimes your your crops don't do so well. But um, uh, rye, uh, rye and vetch, rye and, and field peas is uh, seems really good. Uh, we used rye and crimson clover that was not so good. Uh, and then we would we could use um, hairy vetch by itself, which was great in terms of crop growth. Uh, really, really pushes those crops along with all that nitrogen. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that was a nice little segue into that last tidbit there. <laughs> um, but yeah, that brings us to the end of our time. So um, that, that's a good time to wrap up then. Um, Everybody, thanks for tuning in tonight, and uh, and a huge thanks to Brian and a huge thanks to Jordan for taking the time to put these presentations together and share your experience with these things. Uh, Jordan, obviously, best of luck this year. We'll have to have an update on how all this works for you. Um, but both of you guys, thanks a lot. These were great presentations. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you all. It was wonderful. It was really fun. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, Steve. Cool. Yeah. So um, everybody else, thanks for having, uh, thanks for tuning in. And as you log out, please uh, do take two minutes, real quick, two minutes to, to fill out that survey for us. Let us know um, what you thought about tonight. What, most importantly, what you want to hear about in the future and what we can do to help, uh, to help serve you. So um, thanks for tuning in. And uh, Brian, I hope we stay in touch. That was great information and you guys, you're doing some cool stuff out there. So like to be I appreciate touch. it.
Yeah, thanks, great. Brian. I, I appreciate the things you pointed out. Those are good things to to look closely at. So 